When the magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake erupted from beneath the floor of the northwestern Pacific Ocean on July 29, 2025, it shook not only the eastern edge of Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula, but the entire seismic imagination of the Pacific Rim. The Tembler, one of the strongest ever recorded, sent shockwaves through Earth's crust and ripples across its oceans. Tsunami warnings flashed from Alaska to Japan. Seismic waves pinged around the globe like sonar in a steel sphere. At first, the United States Geological Survey reported no serious impacts on U.S. soil, and scientists were content to place this event within the context of a hyperactive subduction zone thousands of miles away. But just over eight hours after the initial rupture, a subtle and inexplicable rhythm began to emerge beneath the Cascade Range. It started as a faint pattern. A sequence of low-frequency tremors was picked up nearly simultaneously across a chain of dormant and semi-dormant volcanoes stretching from Mount Baker near the Canadian border to Mount Shasta in Northern California. At first, no one at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network thought much of it. Postquake reverberations are not uncommon after a megathrust event like the one that occurred off Kamchatka. Teleseismic waves from such a quake can circle the globe multiple times, agitating crustal boundaries, faults, and hydrothermal systems for days. But this pattern wasn't just one or two anomalous blips. The instruments recorded dozens of discrete bursts of tremor-like motion in regular intervals over a span of nearly six hours. It was Mount Rainier that caught the most attention. At approximately 12.17 in the afternoon Pacific time on July 30th, just over eight hours after the Kamchatka quake, a swarm of long-period seismic signals began pulsing beneath the mountain's southeastern flank. The signals were faint, almost ghost-like, but too structured to be dismissed as noise. Similar signals began to appear within minutes at Mount St. Helen, then Mount Hood, then the Three Sisters Complex in central Oregon. Across the USGS volcano monitoring offices, automatic alert systems quietly triggered. None of the volcanoes showed signs of eruption. No harmonic tremor suggested the movement of magma, and there was no deformation recorded by GPS stations. But the signals themselves, low frequency, high amplitude, rhythmic, were peculiar enough to warrant a full review. By the evening of July 30th, Geologists and seismologists from the U.S. Geological Survey, the University of Washington and the Oregon State University Geophysical Lab had convened in a joint emergency virtual session. The seismic signatures observed were classified as transient volcanic tremor-like pulses with anomalous coherence, meaning they resembled the type of underground vibrations sometimes seen before eruptions, but without the usual precursors such as rising gases, swelling ground, or significant shallow quakes. According to Dr. Lena Valdez, a geophysicist with the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, what we're seeing is not an imminent eruption signal. It's more like the mountain is listening or responding to a global pressure wave. This isn't something we've observed before, at least not in this synchronized a fashion. Dr. Andrew Forrester, a volcanologist at the Cascades Volcano Observatory had reviewed the waveforms from Mount Rainier and noticed something subtle but consistent. The pulses were spaced at near-perfect 11-minute intervals, repeating across five stations over a six-hour window. That kind of timing doesn't happen in random geological noise, Forrester later commented. Something was driving it. Whether it was a passing pressure front in the mantle, or a sympathetic oscillation in the hydrothermal system, or even a resonance effect from teleseismic energy, we just don't know yet. This was not the first time scientists had considered the possibility of long-range interactions between megathrust earthquakes and distant volcanoes. After the massive magnitude 9.1 Sumatra Andaman quake in 2004, researchers found subtle changes in gas emissions and seismic activity at volcanoes across Indonesia. Likewise, after the 2011 Tohoku quake in Japan, Mount Fuji showed an increase in low-frequency tremor and internal fluid movement, though it never erupted. These correlations had long been discussed in journals and academic conferences, but rarely observed in real time across a system as expansive and well-monitored as the Cascades. What made this instance even more unusual 
was the scope of the response. According to composite data collected from over 40 broadband seismic stations from Washington to Northern California, the tremor signals appeared almost simultaneously at up to 14 different volcanic centers. The amplitudes varied by location, but the periodic structure remained consistent. Seismologists likened it to a bell choir responding to a distant but powerful wave. One observer, Dr. Tessa Nakamura from the EarthScope Array research team, described it this way, It's as if the entire arc of the Cascades was gently wrung out by a planetary shockwave, not violently, not enough to cause any damage, just enough to make the mountains hum. By August 1st, the pattern had faded with the tremor pulses gradually diminishing in both strength and frequency. No surface changes were observed, and satellite thermal imagery from NASA's MODIS and VIRS systems showed no uptick in surface heat or degassing. From an operational standpoint, the volcanic alert level system remained green across the board. Commercial aviation, which monitors for ash hazards, was never affected. Hiking trails, visitor centers, and climbing routes around the peaks remained open. And yet, Inside the scientific community, the event had sparked a new wave of inquiry. It was not just a question of whether this tremor was dangerous, it wasn't, but what it meant. The Kamchatka quake itself had been unusually powerful, even for a region well acquainted with seismic violence. That level of energy release is capable of triggering not just tsunamis, but crustal flexure events that reverberate far beyond the rupture site. As those waves traversed the Earth's mantle and crust, their energy decayed but also redistributed, passing through zones of partial melt and hydrothermal systems beneath various continental margins. For the Cascades, sitting atop a relatively young subduction complex and riddled with ancient faults and magma chambers, this made them a sensitive barometer for planetary-scale movement. Think of these systems as loosely wound springs, said Dr. Ian Niles, a structural geologist from Stanford University. They don't need to be triggered in a catastrophic way to respond. Sometimes a distant jolt can make them wobble slightly, enough for us to notice, but not enough for them to break. The USGS has long maintained that the Cascade Range remains volcanically active, even during long periods of quiescence. St. Helen's eruption in 1980 was preceded by only a few weeks of warning. Mount Rainier, often considered the most dangerous volcano in the lower 48 due to its glacial mass and proximity to major cities, has shown persistent but low-level hydrothermal activity for decades. Mount Hood has experienced episodic seismic swarms tied to deep fluid movement. And the Three Sisters complex in Oregon has seen repeated inflation and deflation events in the past 20 years. None of these signals had previously been linked to remote earthquakes until now. As of the first week of August, researchers at multiple institutions were working to model the waveforms that had appeared across the Cascades. Using a technique known as matched filtering, they were comparing the July 30th tremor patterns against historical databases of both tectonic and volcanic earthquakes. Preliminary results suggested that the pulses bore greater resemblance to non-volcanic tremor, a kind of deep crustal vibration often associated with slow-slip events than to shallow eruptive seismicity. That raised the possibility that the tremors were actually driven by frictional movement along deep faults, subtly nudged into motion by the global oscillations caused by the Kamchatka quake. But there was one other theory one not yet publicly released but circulating quietly in closed research forums. Resonance. Some experts proposed that the quake had excited a standing wave within the mantle transition zone, which had then transferred energy to regions of anomalous heat or melt, such as the ones beneath the Cascade Range. This energy, while imperceptible to humans and harmless at the surface, might have produced rhythmic low-frequency tremors in regions already containing partially molten rock or volatiles. In effect, the planet had rung like a bell and certain volcanoes had responded. This idea remains speculative. There is no confirmed mechanism that links specific frequencies of deep Earth resonance to localized surface effects. But the data from July 30th was difficult to ignore. Something had passed through the mountains. 
something coherent, something faint but real. At Mount Rainier, a particularly vulnerable peak due to its extensive glacial coverage and Lahar risk zones, sensors showed subtle thermal changes at known fumarole fields. Though not dangerous in themselves, these temperature shifts may suggest movement of hot fluids through the mountain's internal plumbing, a behavior often linked to changes in magmatic gas pressure or hydrothermal flow. Further south, volcanologists at California's Shasta Trinity National Forest reported increased ground noise, essentially vibrations undetectable to humans but measurable by geophones, within 8 to 10 kilometers, 5 to 6 miles, of Mount Shasta's summit cone. While the signals were brief, they marked the first such detection since late 2022. Mount Shasta has been largely quiet for decades, said Dr. Pauline Truong, a USGS field researcher stationed near Weed, California. So even minor anomalies attract our attention. We're now deploying additional portable instruments to verify whether this is isolated or part of a wider cascade system response. As the weekend approached, the unusual behavior drew interest from geologists across the Pacific. Japanese and Russian scientists offered to share data from their own volcanic networks, many of which had picked up sympathetic tremors in the Kurils and northern Honshu following the magnitude 8.8 .8 main shock. The notion of global coupling, where large earthquakes can influence distant volcanic systems, remained controversial but increasingly supported by emerging data sets. Volcanoes don't operate in isolation, noted Dr. Wren during a Friday afternoon press briefing. They're part of a planetary system that responds to stress redistribution, fluid migration and thermal pulses. We are, perhaps for the first time, beginning to understand how profoundly one event can affect another across hemispheres. At the U.S. Geological Survey's Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, a consensus began to form among researchers that what they were observing was a kind of volcanic micro-resonance. The 8.8 .8 magnitude Kamchatka quake, they suspected, had not just transmitted energy through the crust, but possibly triggered sympathetic oscillations in the deeper magma bodies beneath the Pacific Northwest. These were not precursors to eruption, but rather a subtle and previously unobserved way in which volcanic systems could respond to extreme tectonic events thousands of kilometers away. Meanwhile, over at the University of Washington's Earth and Space Sciences Department, Geophysicist Dr. Sean Weber noted a different anomaly. GPS stations around Mount Baker had recorded minute but sudden ground shifts in both horizontal and vertical directions. Movements of just a few millimetres, but all within the same five-minute window, six hours after the Kamchatka main shock. There was no indication of magma movement or slip events, yet the synchronised shifts implied a coordinated crustal response. When matched against similar data from Rainier and Adams, it formed a bizarre but coherent pattern, like the volcanic chain had momentarily exhaled. In southern Oregon, researchers monitoring the Newbury caldera also noted a temporary increase in geothermal output. Readings from thermocouple sensors placed near fish events along the caldera rim registered an uptick of 0 0.9 degrees Celsius or 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit, in water vapour temperatures over a 16-hour period post-quake. Though small, the rise was statistically significant and followed a similar trend line as seen in Mount Lassen's fumarole activity in Northern California. The timing was too precise to be coincidence. Even far afield, signals had been picked up. A hydroacoustic array anchored off the Washington coast, originally designed to monitor submarine eruptions along the Juan de Fuca Ridge, had recorded a faint chorus of infrasonic signals. These tones, too low to be heard by the human ear, were layered atop each other and stretched over a four-hour period, starting the morning after the quake. The signals were not coming from the ridge, but from under the cascades themselves. The phenomenon puzzled seismologists who until now had believed the region too geologically insulated to produce such sustained acoustic emissions. Yet, despite the anomalies, there was no indication that any eruption was imminent. The tremors were weak. The signals, strange as they were, showed no progressive trend. And although gas emissions had risen slightly in some locations, they remained within historical fluctuation ranges. What made the situation so captivating to scientists, 
and unnerving to some, was the coherence of it all. Nearly every monitored volcanic system in the Cascade Arc had responded, in one form or another, within hours of the Kamchatka megathrust event. None of them erupted, none of them destabilized, but all of them had, for a brief window in time, pulsed in unison. By the third day, seismic activity across the region began to fade. Harmonic tremors fell silent. GPS ground motion readings stabilized, gas emissions declined, satellite imagery showed no thermal anomalies, and the USGS Volcano Hazards Program maintained normal advisory levels for all monitored volcanoes. Whatever resonance had briefly echoed through the cascades appeared to be over, but the question of what it meant lingered. Some researchers speculated this might be the first observed instance of large-scale tectono-volcanic coupling over intercontinental distances, an idea long discussed in theory but rarely demonstrated with clear field data. Others believed it offered new insights into the internal feedback mechanisms of dormant stratovolcanoes, whose subterranean magma chambers might be far more sensitive to dynamic crustal waves than previously assumed. A few more cautious voices wondered if such responses could ever escalate into something more, perhaps if another quake of similar magnitude struck in quick succession. Whether that response is just a footnote in the geological record, or the opening chapter of a new way to understand volcanic systems remains to be seen. But for now, the mountains are quiet once more. Their brief, synchronized pulse, a whisper carried through the bones of the earth, has faded into background noise. If this kind of speculative but scientifically grounded storytelling fascinated you, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more in-depth explorations of Earth's most powerful and mysterious forces. And if you have a theory, a question or a story idea you'd like us to explore, drop it in the comments. We just might dig into it next.